Well, hello. Welcome to Fountain Springs. We're so glad that you're joining us, wherever you're joining us from. Online, television, one of our locations. Uh, we're truly just so glad that you're with us today. Uh, my name is Nicholas, and I work here at the church. And uh, I want to begin today by reading a couple verses that are going to kind of set a trajectory for where we're going to go in just a few minutes. So uh, the first one is Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And then the, the next one is, uh, the second one's from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Uh, this talk today begins the first week of a series that will take us up to and through Easter Sunday. Uh, Easter.church, get your tickets. Easter.church, get your tickets. But it'll take us up, up to and through Easter. And in this series, we're examining the way in which God draws us near to him and... Um, and he draws us near through a series of like all or nothing decisions. There are these moments, right? And it's probably obvious from a series called Hills to Die On where this series will end. It will end with Jesus dying on a hill for all the world to see that he might restore humanity to their creator. But as we are re restored to God, we come to these all or nothing moments of crisis where we have the opportunity to either obey and follow God's will and plan for our life or turn and do our own thing. And this is sort of the story of the relationship between God and people. So today, I want to share some thoughts with you about God's kingdom, what it means to seek his kingdom first. I want to share some thoughts about his kingdom, about how we are to live if we're going to be a part of that kingdom. And I suspect at some point um, the, the conversation may get uh, you know, sharp enough that you'll, you'll I'll, I'll push some of you away. You may feel a temptation to tune out or to walk out. And uh, I want to urge you not to do that. I want to urge you to just kind of stay put because I think there's something really important for us at the end of this. Um, but on the matter of kingdom, where we started in Matthew 6, Jesus tells his audience, before anything else, seek first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, right? Matthew 6, this is about halfway through the Sermon on the Mount. And in context, Jesus and his audience have just been having this conversation about basic needs. But what about my needs? What about my desires? What about my um, uh, wants in life? And Jesus says, before you concern yourself with those things, before you concern yourself with the ways of the world, first, put a couple things in place. First, seek God's kingdom and God's righteousness. But what is his kingdom? When we talk about the kingdom of God, what are we talking about? Well, quite simply, the kingdom of God, his kingdom is a place where God reigns, where God has absolute supreme authority. The kingdom of God is where everything happens as God intends for it to happen. There's no sin. There's no deviation. There's no... Um, all, altering the way and the will of God. It happens as God intends for it to happen. Just a few verses earlier here in Matthew 6, Jesus' disciples come to him and they say, teacher, how should we pray? And uh, if, you, if you remember this, if you've ever said the Lord's Prayer, then you remember this. Um, and he, he tells them, he says, you should, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And then he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so the idea here is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is this realm where God reigns and everything happens as it should happen. And the hope of the people, the prayers of the people should be that God's heavenly kingdom would be breaking into our earthly kingdom, right? 
that through the, 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 the power of the Holy Spirit filling the lives of God's people, we would begin to live out his righteousness. But what is meant by his righteousness, right? Quite simply, this is, it's, it's by righteousness that God makes us fit for the kingdom. God's righteousness is his holiness. It's his absence of sin. It's his purity. And so in God's righteousness, he saves us and prepares us for his kingdom. In righteousness, God wants to save you and me. And then through us, he wants to save all of creation. He wants to redeem all of creation. This is how the, the covenant with Abraham begins. Abram begins in Genesis 12. The promise is, Abram, I will bless you. And through you, I'm going to bless all things, right? That God is going to save us. And through us, God is going to save all things. But what is he going to save us from? S-I-N. God wants to save us from sin. When we talk about sin, there's a twofold problem of sin. First, when we talk about sins, we could talk about actual sins, plural. These, these are any transgressions, any violations of God's commands. When we violate a command of God, it is an actual sin. Sometimes these are sins of omission or things that we don't do that we're supposed to do. Sometimes they're sins of commission or things that we do that we know we shouldn't be doing. Sometimes they're inward, right? They're feelings of lust or prejudice or hatred or bigotry. Sometimes they're outward. They're expressions of violence or theft or, um, uh, or lying, dishonesty, right? Sometimes they're voluntary. Sometimes they're involuntary. There are actual sins, and then there is inbred sin, singular, sin born from within. It is our sinful nature. It's a, it's a state or a condition of our hearts. Sometimes it's called original sin. There is this condition, singular, sin. And actual sins are the consequence, they're, they're the result of inbred sin. It's our, it's our inbred sin that produces, the disease of inbred sin produces the symptoms of actual sins. Does that make sense? We'll talk about that a little bit more here in a minute. But God wants to save us from sin. Well, then how exactly does salvation work? Let me try to, as best I can, walk this out for you today. We are, uh, I'm hoping to use these two doors, by the way, to, um, to, to make sense of it all. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it was good, right? And on the sixth day, God created uh, man, male and female, he created them, uh, we read, and it was good. It was the Hebrew is tov ma'ov. It was, everything was good. Everything was exactly as God intended it to be. But then in Genesis 3, something goes wrong. Eve and then Adam decide to disobey God's command. He's given them one. Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And after some temptation from a serpent, even Adam decide they're going to eat from this tree and they disobey. And in this moment, everything changes. And now these perfect, very good beings, their offspring will inherit this, this condition of inbred sin, original sin, right? We are now born with a bent to do evil. We are totally depraved. We are utterly wicked. We are incapable of righteousness. We are, we are helpless against doing evil. Is this blade cutting sharp enough yet? We are wicked beings. That's the story. Sin reigns in us. Look at Romans chapter 3 here. Verse 11, 
There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. We need to establish this. In our fallen state, sin reigns supreme. God does not reign. Sin reigns in our kingdom. God reigns in his kingdom. Sin reigns. But God has not left us in our helplessness. God reaches out to us. God reaches to us through his prevening grace. Maybe you've heard that word and maybe you haven't. But through God's prevening, prevenient grace, God reaches out to a fallen humanity and he plants a seed inside of us with the ability now to respond to his voice, to respond to his invitation. We are utterly wicked until God plants a seed inside of us, preveningly, preveniently, that allows us now to respond to his voice. It's a prevening work. Let me explain that uh, word in relation to the word uh, convening. At some point today, this gathering that you are in convened, right? You know what this means. Courtrooms convene. Um, wedding ceremonies convene. There was a moment when it began. It hadn't begun, and then it began. It convened. And right now, we are in the convening of this service. It's happening. But there was a tremendous amount of prevening work that went into making this service happen. We rehearsed some songs that we would sing, right? We scheduled some people to show up and make coffee. We got some folks out in the parking lot, waved some lighted, lighted sticks to tell you where to park. Spent some time preparing a sermon for this, preveniently, right? Prevenient work is the work before the work. It's the work that allows the work to happen. Prevening work got these doors on the stage today, literally and metaphorically, right? And we have this amazing production manager who comes up with great ideas. But it's, it's the work before the work that you're witnessing right now when we look at these doors. God plants a seed inside of all of us, giving us the ability to respond to him. His prevening grace is an effort extended to us so that we may be able to hear and respond to what I'm calling door number one here, God's saving grace. The first move is God's prevening grace. He awakens something in our wickedness to be able to hear his voice. And then God's saving grace convicts us of our sin. It makes us aware of our sin. It makes us aware of the guilt and the shame and the consequences of our sin. We feel conviction, if you know that word. We confess our sins through God's saving grace, and we experience his forgiveness. One of the first verses I learned as a little boy, uh, uh, maybe eight years old, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Through God's saving grace, he reaches out to you. He reaches out to me. We hear his voice and he offers us forgiveness if we repent of our sins and turn from them. This is the moment of initial salvation. We sometimes use language of like rebirth or new life, or being born again, or regeneration, when we talk about God's saving grace. What was dead is now brought to life. What was dead is now brought to life through God's saving grace. Remember that scene in John chapter 3, uh, a few verses before the most famous one, right? John 3.16, but in 3.3, 3, Jesus is having this conversation with Nicodemus, who's interested in He's a Jew who's interested in the, the teachings of Jesus. And at some point, Jesus tells him, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born again. You have to experience, in response to God's saving grace, the old you, you have to be brought to life, experience new life, be born again, right? The old is gone 
And as a result of God's saving grace, you are a new creation. We receive freedom from the guilt, the shame, and the consequences of our sin. Think judicial. Think legal here. The punishment for our sins was hell. And we are forgiven for our sins. Therefore, we can have full confidence that we will spend eternity in heaven. When we repent in turn from our actual sins, our actual sins, we turn from them out of conviction. We experience God's saving grace and we experience this moment of initial salvation. Now, many of you here today have walked through door number one before. You know about God's saving grace. You've been set free from the guilt of your past sins, the shame of your past sins, the punishment for your past sins. You were dead in Christ and now you are awakened. And you should probably be a little more excited about that when I bring it up. Just between you and I. But I recognize this is um, a heavy conversation we're having right now. And it's going to get heavier. In God's saving grace, you're set free from the consequences of your sin. Praise God, you're set free. And though sin no longer reigns, it does remain. No longer reigns, it does remain. Now here is, here's the problem. In our churches, all too often, this is where our conversation ends about sin and salvation and holiness. Door number one, God's saving grace. You sinned. You know you sinned. You feel bad about it. You're going to try not to do it again. Okay, cool. You don't have to go to hell when you die. God has saved you. And often in response to this, we get baptized. Everybody cheers. It's this really powerful, euphoric experience. But too often, this is where it stops. We stop with door number one, and we never make it to door number two, which is God's sanctifying grace. God doesn't just want to save us. He wants to sanctify us. Back to 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. 1 Thessalonians. Four, three through eight. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. And then the last one, Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is your true and proper worship. Door number one is God's saving grace. And it gives us freedom from the guilt and the punishment of actual sins. But God's sanctifying grace is a different work altogether. Door number one is about forgiveness, but door number two is about holiness. Liberty and freedom, not just from the power of sin. I'm sorry, not just from the guilt of sin, but from the being of sin, the presence of sin in our lives. If I'm losing you, hold on. Sanctification and holiness are like these old, outdated, often avoided words. But what they represent is freedom from the power of inbred sin. Sinful nature, original sin. Here you're forgiven for your actual sins. God's sanctifying grace is about that sinful nature. It's the disease, the virus, 
the sickness, the darkness. See, the main goal of the Christian life is not to get to heaven with a heart full of sin. Some people say, I'm a sinner. I'm going to sin. But God offers forgiveness. And he doesn't see my sin when he looks at me. He only sees the blood of Jesus. And that is how this whole thing works. At least I don't have to go to hell. I'm sorry. That is not true. That is bad theology. That is unbiblical. It truly is. That's not true. If I can see your sin, God can see your sin. If you can see my sin, God can see my sin. Feel the temperature rising? The problem humanity faces is not hell. It's sin. Jesus did not come to save us from hell. He came to save us from sin. The Bible literally says, the New Testament literally says this everywhere. And somehow we've confused his heart with his hand. We've confused the rewards of our salvation with the purpose of our salvation. And the purpose for salvation from sin is not to like, you know, beat us into submission. I'm not bringing this up. I said this earlier. I'm not bringing this up because I was looking for something to try to like get people mad about or I need something interesting to talk about. It's because sin destroys us. It destroys us. It's great to be saved from the consequences of sin. That's the first work. But the goal is not that this becomes like a revolving door. You sin, you feel guilty, you ask for forgiveness. You sin, you feel guilty, you ask for forgiveness. That's not the point of God's saving grace. This is intended to be a passageway. It begins with the recognition that God has saved you from the guilt of your sin. And it leads you to a place where God will save you from the presence of your sin. The being of your sin. It's true, you cannot stop sinning on your own. But you are not your own anymore. We just established that. You are a new creation filled with the Spirit of God. And by the power of God's Spirit, we are called to holiness. I've noticed that a lot of people lose their enthusiasm for uh, God's saving grace after a short period of time. It doesn't take long before like, you lose the excitement of singing about freedom from your guilt and your shame and your consequences of sin because you're still living in like the chains and the slavery of sin. How how long can I sing about the forgiveness of the things that I've done? I want to be set free for the person that I am. I don't want to be this way anymore. I want to be remade into who Jesus is. I sometimes hear people say they wish they could get baptized again, water baptism. They have this powerful experience. Some of you have said that to me, probably. (laughs) I should get baptized again. Because it feels so great the first time. You know what I mean? Everyone's cheering. It's exciting. You don't need to get baptized again. It wouldn't feel the same way even if you did. What you need is to move from your water baptism to your spiritual baptism. There's more to this story. And somehow we've left it out. I love this quote by Oswald Chambers. Great name for a baby boy, by the way. Continually restate to yourself what the purpose of your life is. The destined end of man is not happiness nor health, but holiness. The end of Christianity is liberty. It's not just from the punishment of actual sins, but it's liberty from the bondage of inbred sin. That's the word, bondage. Sin leaves us in bondage. You have more to hope for than simply wanting to commit the same sins over and over, but trying not to. Jesus did not die so that I don't have to feel bad about the sins that I keep on committing. 
And some of you have been battling the same sins for longer than you can remember. And maybe you've just accepted that that's the way that it is. Some of you have been battling sins for years, the same ones. And you've experienced no freedom. When we sing about the freedom like we did in a couple of our songs, when we sing about the freedom in Christ, we're not talking about freedom from hell. That's the punishment. We're singing about freedom from sin. God wants to set us free from that darkness, that bentness inside of our souls. Some of us, though, we come to church, we serve, we lift our hands in worship, we lead our families in prayer. We, we look very respectable from the outside. As far as any of the rest of us can see, you're saved, you're forgiven, you're going to heaven when you die, but you are living in bondage to sin. You experience a living hell. This sermon is about as much fun to preach as it is to hear. I understand what I'm talking about right now. I can see it on your faces. Every one of you are thinking, five more minutes maybe? Can we get out of here? Again, I'm not up here talking about this because I feel like it would be compelling. Friends, sin is destroying us. And we stopped the work of God in our lives because we experienced his saving grace. And we found out that we wouldn't go to hell someday. But we're living in hell now. Jesus did not come to save us from hell. He came to save us from sin. He came to make us holy. But it's a different sort of work. Door number one brings pardon. But door number two is sanctifying grace brings purity. With door number one, we are criminals in need of mercy. But with door number two, we are slaves in need of liberty. Do you understand the difference? Door number one removes the guilt of sin. But door number two removes the poison of sin. God's saving grace takes us out of the world. But his sanctifying grace takes the world out of us. I'm not just trying to be cute with words here. Our actual sins can be forgiven. But inbred sin has to die. Our sins, plural, can be forgiven, but our sin, singular, the only way forward is death. It has to die. And so when Jesus and his apostles and Paul, when they're talking about God's saving grace, they're using language of new birth, new life, new creation, right? Be born again. But when they talk about God's sanctifying grace, they use language of death. Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ. Jesus says, take up your cross, lay down your life. The sanctifying work of God is about death. The death of your inbred sinful nature. For 29 and a half years, my stepdad, who was my dad, my stepdad worked at a factory in Michigan that made batteries for Ford trucks. And every day I can remember, he carried the same lunchbox to work. It was one of those old lunchboxes that you know, flipped up on the top and the thermos would fit up, but then everyone loses the thermos or it falls in the glass inside breaks and then you just have a bigger lunchbox. My dad had one of those. And he had a sticker on the top of it that said, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. Uh, I actually heard Peyton Manning, whatever you think of Peyton Manning, say this recently. He said, my faith doesn't make me perfect, but it makes me forgiven. With all due respect to Peyton Manning and my stepfather, who I adore more than most any man who's ever lived, that's simply not true. Our faith is making us perfect. That's kind of the whole point, is it's freeing us from the destruction of sin. That's what all of this is about. It's not about going to heaven when you die. As glorious and magnificent as that will be, it's about freedom from sin because, folks, 
Sin is misery. It's misery. I know that. I think you know that, but I know that firsthand. I know how sin destroys you. How it, we, it makes you wish you've never been born. Yes, sin's fun at first. Anyone who says differently is lying. It's fun at first. But give it a few hours. Give it a day. And don't be surprised if you aren't on your knees somewhere in your home wishing you would die. How many people in this room maybe have, or watching, how many people maybe have some sort of inclination or addiction to drugs or alcohol that's destroyed everything in your life? I have a relative like this, very close relative now, destroyed everything, all her relationships. You don't think that she would like to quit? She's in bondage. You're destroying your lives, not because you want to. You're in chains. You're in bondage. I suspect there are people in this room who um, have encounters with men or women who aren't their spouses. Maybe because you're unmarried. Maybe you're not, you know, maybe you are married. But I wonder if there aren't people in this room who aren't living God's plan for sexuality in your life. I know how that feels. I've been it. I've been there. And I know how it, it makes you wish it was all over. You just, you, you wish you'd die. You feel that alone and isolated and ashamed? Sin destroys us. If I could see everything that shows up on your computer screens or your iPads, your cell phones, we all know what the statistics say, right? Number of people looking at things they shouldn't be looking at. It's fun for a few seconds while you're looking at it, but how do you feel afterwards? We all know that feeling too. Like, like you'd give anything to be free from the bondage of that sin. That's how sin works. You'd give anything to be free from it, from your addictions. You aren't created for them. They're literally working against your divine nature, but you are in bondage and you would give anything to be free. And that's the offer. The offer is freedom. It's liberty from the bondage of sin. Not just in eternity, not just the guilt of sin, the presence of sin in your life. God's spirit wants to burn like fire. No, you can't do it on your own. But what you can do is be so filled with the Holy Spirit that there's no room for who you used to be left in your soul. That's how it works. Remember how C.S. Lewis uh, in Screw Tape Letters, he said um, that, like in, uh, that, that what humans don't realize is that in laying down their lives, they become more of themselves than they ever were trying to protect their lives, right? That it's surrendering our lives to God that helps us realize what we were created to be. You are not created to live in sin. You were not called from one sin to another. You were not called from more sins to fewer sins. You were not called from bigger sins to smaller sins. You are called from darkness to light. From impurity to holiness. That is how God designed us to live. And every day we spend living in sin is one more day of unnecessary self-destruction. We all agree there's going to be no more sin in heaven, right? So when will we be set free? I think the promise of Jesus and the promise of the New Testament writers is it doesn't have to wait until your death. God can set you free to live a holy life now to be free from the bondage of your sin. That's what God wants to do. The gospel's about liberty. And if we're teaching that the good news is merely 
When you die, you go to heaven. We're only telling half the story and we're not even telling the best half of the story, which is you can be free from the bondage of sin today. God wants to set you free. Fact. That's a fact. God wants to set you free from sin. So here's what we're going to do. The book of Hebrews, Hebrews 3, 7, I think, says, Today, if you hear the voice of the Lord, do not harden your heart. Today, if you hear the voice of the Lord, do not harden your heart. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me. Would you stand with me? This is a conversation that can hit every one of us. It doesn't matter who you are in the room right now. It doesn't matter what your history is in the room right now. I don't care if this is your first time in church or you've been here a thousand times. Don't care if you've been a Christian for 60 years or you don't even know if you want to be one yet. It doesn't matter if you're a respected city official, successful businessman in town, just got out of prison, behind on your child support. None of that matters in this room in a conversation about God's salvation. What's that saying? The ground is level at the foot of the cross. We all come at this with the same need. Don't let your reputation, don't let what others are going to think in here keep you from experience the, experiencing the freedom that God wants you to have. We are not created to live lives of sin. It's horrible for us. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna pray in just a second, but I'm gonna give you an opportunity to respond. If you would like me to pray for you right now with this prayer, that you would be set free from the chains of bondage of sin, I'm gonna scan the room couple times, and I just want you to slip up your hand. If you want to be free from the bondage of sin and you want me to pray for you, just slip up your hand. Hands everywhere. Let's pray. Almighty God, you have saved us from our guilt and our shame and our consequences, Lord, but you want to set us free from the bondage that remains. God, would you give us the faith to believe in the power of your spirit? Lord, may we surrender our wills. May we die to ourselves. May we be crucified with Christ to receive the power of your spirit so fully in our hearts, in our souls, that there's no room for sin anymore. God, we're forgiven for the actions. We want to be set free from the condition. We want to be set free from the slavery of sin, Lord. So for everybody who raised their hand, Lord, pour your spirit out on their hearts right now. Pour your spirit into their lives. Remind them of who they are and who they are not. What they were created for and what they were not created for. God, set them free so that they would be a slave to nothing but Christ. By your power, they would be free to love you with all of their hearts and then to love each other with all of their hearts. And that's how the kingdom of God is accomplished here when we're free and perfect love to love one another. God, pour your spirit out in this place. As we go from here, may your spirit stay with us, Lord. We pray for your spiritual presence in the lives and in the hearts of every one of these individuals, God. We claim, I don't want to sound like one of those TV preachers, but we claim victory. It's there. It's in scripture. We are called to live holy lives, Lord. We want to be holy. By your spirit, make us holy. We love you. In your name, amen and amen. amen.